Good afternoon, everyone, and it's such a pleasure to join you at the International Workshop on HIV and Pediatrics for 2023. I'm going to be talking about one of the major challenges and the major opportunities as we think about supporting adolescents living with HIV. And we'll think about, um, in, this, in this session, we'll think about firstly, what's the latest evidence base on mental health and ART adherence and, and how they link together. We're going to think about what might be driving those mental health challenges. And, and that will help to think forward to, to the solutions and intervention options, which is a, a new and growing evidence base. As, as we also consider this in relation to the broader perspective of changes in HIV funding and growing numbers of adolescents living with HIV. So really, as we look at the 1.7 million adolescents and over 5 million young people living with HIV around the world, we're seeing um, disturbingly low rates of viral suppression. This was from an outstanding um, idea collaboration. This was a in 2021 across 31 countries. And I think the key things to look at, if we look at the children and adolescents to the left, we see these high rates in dark gray of, um, of young people and adolescents lost to follow up. We also see, if you look down at the white bar at the bottom, really low rates of viral load suppression. And, and um, substantially lower than adults, and really a major challenge for us as we think about supporting them throughout their lifetimes. When we look at evidence um, from government clinics in high burden context, this was a study in 72 public healthcare facilities in um, the Eastern Cape of South Africa over three years, we again see these very low rates of um, self-reported adherence to antiretroviral medicine, so going down to 37% with consistent rates across three years. And we, there's increasing evidence that adolescents living with HIV are experiencing real mental health challenges. And Lorraine Scher looked at four systematic reviews, um, and they really have a high high level of agreement. We're seeing about a quarter of adolescents living with HIV experiencing clinical level mental health distress, primarily depression and anxiety. And around the, a wider 30 to 50% experiencing emotional or behavioral difficulties. A recent um, meta-analysis um, by Sege looks at um, suicidal ideation and finds that over 10% have current suicidal ideation with high rates of suicide attempts. There's been some recent studies looking at um, impacts of COVID-19. There are indications that that's increased levels of mental health distress, but, but it, the evidence is still a bit unclear for now. And, and I, not to be forgotten with that is, um, is the neurocognitive impacts of HIV. And, and there's been, you know, there, there used to be much more research on that in, in early childhood, but increasingly, we're seeing in, in systematic reviews that, um, that adolescents living with HIV are experiencing some um, challenges with cognitive function. Um, and that seems very related to social and economic and emotional challenges that they experience. But it's really important to think about that, both when we think about their mental health challenges, but also how they might engage with mental health treatments and other supportive services. I think um, what's even more um, concerning, and, and this, um, this was recently presented by Claude Mellons at the AIDS Impact Conference in, in her plenary. When she looked, um, and this is, this is this sort of incredible study where they followed young people living with HIV right through from childhood um, over five time points. And I think what's really um, crucial here is that when we start to look at a life course perspective, we see even higher rates 
of mental health distress. And if you look, um, if you look at some of these bubbles, we'll see that 83 percent of these young people have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder at least one time, and 53 percent, half of them, diagnosed more than once with a with an um, with a mental health disorder. We see with um, mood disorders, 26 percent at least once, and so. Um, we're really seeing that young people living with HIV are facing these, these long-term, extended and repeated challenges with their mental health. There are many groups within these young people who are experiencing even higher mental health challenges. And two recent studies in South Africa and Uganda have found very similar results. They found that, um, that um, Adolescent mothers who are living with HIV are experiencing the double burden and, and often um, diagnosed during pregnancy and seeing very high rates of mental health disorder. And, and that's, that's also impacting um, on their children and their children's capacity. And there have been a number of studies which have looked at linkages between mental health and non-adherence or, or um, or viral load suppression. Um, Eugene Kenyanda has done some excellent work on this in, in Uganda. But I think for me, this, this graph um, by Liz Lowenthal and colleagues in Botswana really, um, really conveys that, that, um, that as we see um, mental health distress increase, we also see virologic failure increase. And of course, there's a circular um, relationship here as well. But at this point, it's, it's impossible to deny that at least some of the challenges that we're seeing in, um, in adherence and in, um, and in, in retention in, in antiretroviral care are being driven by these mental health experiences. But if we then ask ourselves a bit wider, what is driving these, this mental health distress? And this study by, um, by Marissa Casali um, with a thousand adolescents living with HIV finds that, that we're seeing these, these um, social factors predicting distress. And so in this study, she sees that, um, the, that the young people being bullied is leading to, to mental health distress and directly leading in to non-adherence. But again, if you look to the bubble on the right hand side, that can be um, moderated by, um, by good parental monitoring, so good parenting, and they're starting to give us some indications on interventions. This is Ilona Tosca's work um, in South Africa. And we see here that um, when we look at the, um, the risk of um, a combination of unsuppressed viral load and, um, and um, risky behaviors, we see that that's being driven by a combination of um, hunger, um, being in a power inequitable relationship, um, substance use primarily that's being driven by, by mental health. Um, and that those combinations, when we look at these social factors together, we're seeing um, a rise in this, this high risk um, experience from 16% from, um, from up to 89% for girls. We are also seeing um, drivers of mental health distress that, that, that may not be apparent, that may not be discussed or disclosed. Um, this, this paper um, by CNI Zhu shows, looks at the impacts of experience of intimate partner violence and sexual abuse. And again, we see this, this um, impact of each of these types of abuse and a combined impact um, driving down adherence from 72% to, to just over 30%. We also see Tonya Thurman's work, um, which has found that, um, that adolescents who've been bereaved, who've lost their parents, are at much higher risk of mental health distress. And these may be things that, um, that for a healthcare practitioner, don't get mentioned, um, and, um, and maybe things that we need to really make sure that we ask young people about. And so what are some of the options that we can think about in, in the real world? And when we say the real world, we have to think beyond um, well-funded clinics and into um, challenged and overburdened government healthcare systems and also 
but in a in a world where we might be uh, where we are likely to be seeing reductions in HIV funding and HIV specific funding over time. And, and I've been really influenced in much of this thinking um, by work, particularly with colleagues at the WHO. Um, you'll see Wole um, here, um, who's, who's driven a lot of this, but also colleagues with UNICEF's um, Eastern and Southern Africa HIV team, who, who are really thinking about sustainable and integrated care for adolescents living with HIV. This, um, this, these fairly new WHO guidelines were driven by a systematic review of interventions for, um, for the mental health of adolescents living with HIV. And also led by Zvandiri were, were consultations with young people across 45 countries. And really the conclusion was a strong recommendation that psychosocial support does need to be integrated into HIV care, but also a recognition that we do need to be increasing the evidence base for this. However, we have made huge strides. So in the last five years, we've seen a real increase in evidence for community-based mental health interventions. And um, Svandiri, Pata, um, are great examples of these. Um, there's some great work happening um, in Ketampilo in South Africa. And what we're seeing is, is some really similar um, approaches. So problem solving approaches, cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness approaches, you know, all which have a similar um, basis in, in psychiatric and psychological care. All working, we're seeing that being, being effective when delivered through task sharing, um, a recent great trial by the Svandiri team, but also through mental mothers for, for those particularly high risk groups of adolescent mothers. There's also exciting new interventions that cross across the clinic and community. For example, Elaine Abrams and colleagues, ongoing randomized trial in Mozambique. Um, we've also seen in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia, some, um, some, some really innovative work on supporting parents. Um, this is led by um, Claude Mellons, Mary McKay and colleagues, but some really um, positive impacts of supportive programs to help families support young people. We, we, um, we may be mistaken if we think that, that the clinic is the primary source of support. They're spending actually very small amounts of time in the clinic and the vast majority of their time um, with peers and with their families. We're also seeing um, new innovation in thinking about digitally delivered adherence programs. And at the moment, the, um, the evidence is quite mixed. A very recent systematic review um, has found a, a kind of set of mixed results. And, and that may be because we're looking at a set of different programs just through the, the delivery mechanism. But again, with text message interventions, we're also seeing mixed results. And so I think, um, I think some of the conclusions from this are that there's enormous potential in digital delivery, but that we may need to really refine the content of programs. And we really may need to learn from, from other health um, digital programs. There is actually, if you look at broader research on this, we find very low tension in digital health apps more broadly, um, or digital health delivery, um, you know, somewhere between 2% and 26%. And, and we've got a lot to do to understand how do we, how do we make a digital program engage with people or, or, or make them um, ha have the kind of social engagement that, that may be needed to, um, to support those being a highly effective delivery mechanism. We're also seeing real impacts of social and economic support. And this was work um, with Gretchen Buchmann um, and CNI Zhu, um, looking at the impacts of receiving psychosocial support, that's a, a support in the community, and economic support, which was a government cash transfer in South Africa. And we see really strong impacts of that, that combined intervention on, um, on viral load and on um, antiretroviral adherence. In, um, in Uganda, if you look to the right, this was work um, led by um, Fred Sussumala and colleagues. And this was a delivery of an economic um, family-based intervention. And again, we're seeing positive impacts on viral load. So I think some really clear findings there. We're also seeing positive impacts of just making youth health health services more respectful and, and we talk about youth friendliness but actually in these um 
In these analyses led by Alona Tosca in South Africa, what we see is that um, just having a clinic which is safe to go to, which um, they can afford to get to, and to have um, uh, staff who, who don't shout at an adolescent girl, we see um, reductions in, um, in viral non-suppression, we see improvements in clinic attendance, we see reductions in HIV symptomatology, reductions in treatment interruptions, and higher adherence to antiretrovirals. If we, if we also need to think perhaps more broadly about, um, about adolescents living with HIV, when, when we talk to them in, in consultations, they're very clear that they want to have um, happy, successful lives, just like any other young person person just, just like all of us. And so it can be valuable to think about interventions and com simple combinations of interventions that can improve both mental health and adherence, but can also improve other outcomes which are really of importance to them, like school progression, like violence prevention, reductions in, um, in risky situations for sexual risk. And here in this study, we see that the combination of parenting support, as we saw in, in these studies, of a school where they're not exposed to violence, so again, safety, and of a government cash transfer can have these multiple positive impacts for young people. But we are facing a, not even a gap, but a chasm in treatment. If we look at um, globally at adolescents living with HIV, only a tiny fraction of them receive any mental health care at all. And our, our reviews, we did substantial reviews um, last year with Professor Lorraine Scher and colleagues for, for a paper in The Lancet and found almost zero evidence for, um, for adolescents living with HIV and almost no services for those who are, who are living on the streets, those who are selling sex, those who are living with disabilities, those who need palliative care, although Richard Harding has done one really successful study showing that that's, that's very helpful. And also um, for, for adolescents living with HIV in humanitarian contexts and climate crisis. And these are really crucial um, and growing groups. And so we need to be taking these, these pilots, this early evidence base that we have, into scaled up services. And we've got some good evidence now of, um, of the effectiveness of services delivered through peer supporters, through task sharing. It doesn't need to be through doctors and qualified nurses. And I think that's really encouraging in overburdened health systems. There's some great evidence, um, which is not HIV focused, but which is the broader mental health field from Crick Lund, Mark Tomlinson, Vikram Patel, about integrating services into primary health, integrating mental health services um, in very low income contexts. And it's been successfully um, done into primary health care. And that can be a real lesson for us. Chris Desmond talks often about the importance of strengthening the family. And this is what um, Linda Richter, Lorraine Scher, and, and, um, and colleagues talked about um, as we started the HIV epidemic and first looked at children, but that strengthening families are the first point of contact um, and the most sustained and sustainable point of care for adolescents living with HIV. And increasing new evidence suggests that national government systems such as social protection, um, government cash transfers can have a crucial aspect of supporting mental health care, but also supporting adherence. And so I'd like to end by saying that this is not, this is not just mental health is not just about what we can give to people. Um, like all healthcare and support, it's about that interaction. It's about um, being part of supporting young people to live the lives they want and achieve the things that they want. And I wanted to leave you with the words of this young woman, because I think she can teach us a lot about mental health, about adherence, and about how we think about young people living with HIV. Thank you.